For example, suppose A is this matrix, and the reduced raw echelon form of A R is given like so. Let's find the basis for the column space of A. The column space of A, by definition, is the span of the column vectors. So we have a generating set, and it's that this is the generating set for column space of A. But a basis is a set that is linearly independent, and that generates column space of A. So how can we make them linearly independent? We know a subset of these vectors is linearly independent, right? And the subset has the same span as this bigger set. What is the set? It's the subset of the pivot columns. And we know this is a pivot column, this will be a pivot column. So span 1, 3 will be a generating set. And uh, so 1, 3, the set of A1 and A3 is a generating set. And they are linearly independent. So it's a generating set, yes. And it's linearly independent, yes. So this is a basis for column space of A. We have also defined row space of A, and we know it is a subspace. So let's try to find a basis for row space of A. The row space of A, by definition, is the span of the row vectors. We have also mentioned that the row space of A is in fact the same as the row space of R. And we have R right here. So let's try to find the row space of R here. It seems to be easier, an easier matrix. Let's express the row vectors of R, D1 transpose, D2 transpose, and D3 transpose. By definition, the row space of R is span D1, D2, and D3. But we know some of these vectors can be thrown away, right? For example, the last vector is the zero vector, and we can remove it. Then we get span d1, d2, d3 equal to span d1 and d2. So d1 and d2 is a generating set for row space of R. Now the question is, are they linearly independent? If they are linearly independent, then we have a basis for row space of R and hence a basis for row space of A. Are they? They are. Why? Because the non-zero rows of R are linearly independent, as we have seen earlier. So now we get a basis for row space of A. The non-zero rows of R. Now, how about a basis for null space of A? Null space of A, by definition, is the solution set of the homogeneous equation. And we know how to find a generating set for the, hom for the solution set of homogeneous equation, right? We use Gaussian elimination to find the vector form of the general solution like so. And the null space of A is the span of these two vectors. So we have a generating set. The question is, are these two vectors linearly independent? We need to examine two properties, whether it's a linearly independent, whether it's a generating set. And we already know it's a generating set. So this one is OK. How about linearly independent property? This is also true, isn't it? Because we have mentioned that the vectors in the vector form of general solution are linearly independent. So these vectors indeed 
form a basis for null space of A. Here we have a work on a particular example of A and find the column space, the row space, and the the null space. We find basis for all these three subspaces. Although the example that we we're working on is a particular example, but we can conclude we can make a more general conclusion. For example, if we want to find a column space of A, the generating the pivot columns is always always form a generating set, and we know the pivot columns are always linearly independent. So we can conclude that the pivot columns of A form a basis for column space of A. How about the dimension for the column space of A? The dimension of a subspace is the number of vectors in a basis for the subspace. So how many vectors are there in in the basis formed by the pivot columns? How many pivot columns are there for a given matrix A? We know the number of pivot column is related to a particular number, right? Rank of A. So the di dimension of the column space of A is uh, simply the rank of A. Similarly, when we find a basis for row space of A, we have observed that the non-zero rows of R they are linearly independent, and they form a generating set for row space of R. So we can conclude that the non-zero rows of R form a basis for row space of A, and this is also the result in theorem 4.8. How about the dimension of the row space of A? How many non-zero rows do we have? How is this number of non-zero rows of R related to A? Pause and think about this. Ready? It's the rank of A again, isn't it? So both the dimension of column space of A and the dimension of row space of A are equal to rank of A. Now for the null space. When we find a basis for the null space, we first find the vector form of the general solution, and we found out that these vectors in the vector form of the general solution, they are always linearly independent, and they are always, they always generate, they always form a generating set for the null space of A. So these vectors form a basis for the null space of A. So we can say that the vectors in the general form in the general solution of the homogeneous equation form a basis for null space of A. How about the dimension? How many vectors are there in the basis? How many vectors would there be in the basis? We see that as long as there's one free variable, there's one vector. One free variable, there's a vector associated with this vector. So, what's the number of vectors in the basis? Would be the number of free variable. And we have a special name for the number of free variables. The Nullity of A. So the three types of uh, subspaces that we talked about that are associated with the, mat with the matrix A, the column space of A, the row space of A, the null space of A, the dimension of these null spaces are tied nicely to the numbers that we have talked about, rank of A, rank of A, and nullity of A. One last result in this section. 
theorem 4.9. V and W are subspaces of Rn, and W contains V. So we can say V is a subset of W. Then, first of all, the dimension of V must be smaller or equal to the dimension of W. And that's quite intuitive, right? This is W and this is V. W contains V, so V may be the same as W, but it's inside W. So the dimension of V must be smaller or equal to W. It may be as large as W. The second result, V is equal to W if they have the same dimension. If they have the same dimension, then we can immediately conclude that they are the same subspace. When we work with the subspaces, it's usually a good idea to start with the basis. So let's say that, suppose beta is a basis for V. Let's work on the proof of one first. We want to show that the dimension of V is smaller or equal to the dimension of W. Beta is a basis for V, so beta must be a linearly independent subset of W because the basis is a linearly independent set. So beta is a linearly independent subset of W. And uh, we know whenever we are given a linearly independent subset of a subspace, we can extend it to a basis beta prime for W by extension theorem. And this beta prime, by our construction, will be a set that contains this beta. So now we have two bases. Beta is a basis for V and beta prime that contains beta is a basis for W. So naturally, beta prime would have Vector number the vector of number of vectors in beta prime will be at least as large as the number of vectors in beta. So we can conclude that the dimension of V cannot be larger than the dimension of W. Now let's consider the proof for the second. If they have the same dimension, then V and W must be the same set. We start out with a basis beta for V, right? And this beta, we know it is linearly independent, and the number of vectors in beta is the same as the dimension of W. So, we know beta is a basis for W, too. So, V and W must be the same set. 